Well, welcome to love, marriage, parenting, and other chaos. That's been the title of our series. This is the fifth sermon. Today, I do want to talk about our children. It's disciplining, discipling, and blessing our children. Yes, those words are spelled correctly. I had to do a little spell check myself on that. They all look kind of weird, but it's true. It's the way it's spelled. Disciplining and discipling and blessing. Psalm 127 in the New Living says, Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builder is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you, listen to this, it is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxious, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. Now, there were some folks in our church in Texas, and I would quote that scripture as I preached on this. There was a man who had, they had four or five, maybe six kids. He said, my quiver is full and running over, and I don't need any more arrows in my quiver. So if you've got five or six kids, you may feel that way. I don't know about you, Whitney and Darren, you may feel that way. By the way, thanks to everyone who brought them such a wonderful shower on Thursday night. And we love you guys, and we hope that this girl is a blessing to you. It's just another arrow in the quiver. Amen. And God will help you with that. God's covenant blessings spoken over his people included the children. I want you to understand this. His first act after creating Adam and Eve was to bless them, but to also tell them to replenish the earth. Here it is in Genesis 1.28. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Noah and his sons received a word blessing from the Lord. Uh, God's covenant blessing spoken to Abraham about the promised child of Isaac. David promised offspring. David was conscious of the fact that it would it was the favor of God and it would it would be a blessing to his kingdom and to his life and to his family. The blessings upon his household. I believe it's through children that God plans to continue the redemptive benefits of the covenant that he's established. The promise of children is common to all the covenants God has made to man. And there's a purpose for that. Every time you look at your children or think of them, remember, that's a sign that God has not nullified the covenant promise to replenish the earth and to bless his kingdom with your children. Now, we'll get later on about how that works. Prophet Malachi taught that the sign was in Malachi 4, 6, the heart of the fathers were turned to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. So God's covenant plan of blessing and families has not changed. He'll continue his work through the children that have been blessed and confirmed by the faith. The Lord's ordained that parents perpetuate this redemptive work by imparting blessing to their children. And we will do that today. And teaching their children to do the same to their children. I know we've had a discussion recently with our son about a mission field, about his children being sure they have experienced the mission field. Our daughter and her husband have done that with their children. I think it's important to understand what it means for our children to see the larger picture. God has placed great value on the lives of children. There's plans for tomorrow. That, that's how the perpetuation of the kingdom of God will keep going. And that through them, the life of Jesus will change the world. You see, what we, we forget sometimes is that we can't just leave it to someone else. No one can place a value on your children. They are priceless gifts from the hand of God. Now, I know they didn't always seem like that. I know there are moments in your life, hectic times, funny moments. A lady was cleaning her house, had the vacuum cleaner going, and she was doing her thing, and she was singing, Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. And she kept singing that song, and she heard a voice in the other room. Her little toddler was singing, Soon and very soon, we are going to Burger King. (laughs) 
funny moments. We've all got a lot of them. We think back to our children and, and their growing up years and those things that we've all done when we were children in the church. I remember singing the wrong words to a lot of songs that we used to sing in church. Till I realized when I got to where I could read, I go, oh, it means that, huh? So discipline is important, but so is discipling. In disciplining, we teach them how to walk and talk and act and speak correctly. And hopefully show them how to exercise power and control over themselves. But we also must not forget to disciple them. And disciple and discipline come from the same word. It's all about learning. God created them for a reason, gave them a purpose. He has a purpose for every life of every person who's breathing on this earth today. I know the routines get very chaotic. I remember, I understand. Get the kids up, supervise them, getting ready for school, get them on the bus, drop them off at school, whatever you do, however you get that, arrange a pickup to get them back home, get dinner going, homework that evening, uh, stuff then that night at school or at church or whatever's going on, ball games and all that. Get out their clothes for the next school day, get them in bed, get yourself in bed way too late, usually. But then you repeat it, and you repeat it, and you repeat it, and the routines just kind of get so laborious. It takes a lot of discipline to get our children through their days, but it also takes discipline to get ourselves through our days. How many realize that? Sometimes you just get exhausted. We know we must discipline the children. We know we must tell them what's right and wrong. I've said it before. Every two-year-old is a terrorist. Every baby born, actually, is a terrorist. Now, we don't confess that over them. I want you to know that. Don't confess. God, this child is a terrorist. Don't do that. I did when Sean was about a year and a half. And uh, I said, Lord, are you sure you want us to have this child? <laughs> you know, we were at a dinner table. He's throwing food everywhere on us and everybody else. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Lord. But we don't ever receive any formal training. This is a sensitive issue. There's no formal training. I mean, think about it. You spend 13 to 18 years in school learning the skills you'll need in life to get along, right? Yet probably in that entire time, you'll never learn much or be taught about marriage or parenting. 13 to 20 years going to school with college included. Spend the rest of your life being a spouse or a parent and nobody ever told you how to do either one of them. So what do we do? How do we do it? Well, we do it like our parents did it, don't we? And that's sometimes really bad news for some of our children. Because maybe our parents didn't raise us correctly. My, my guess is that those of you who didn't receive good parenting probably frustrated every time you say or do something that reminds you of your parents, that stuff you didn't like very much, right? When you, you find yourself doing it because we didn't receive training. We, nobody gave us a manual on how to raise that child. I mean, there's plenty out there. You can do that. It's really odd, isn't it? Because if you worked at McDonald's, somebody's going to teach you how to flip a hamburger. If you were a dental assistant like Carol used to be, they'd train you on how to grind that tooth down and how to prepare and get all the setup ready for an extraction or whatever they're doing. Or if you were a rock and roll DJ like I was at 17, believe it or not, they named me Wild Child. I had the 12 midnight to 6 a.m. slot. My dad was a pastor. He didn't like that too much. But they did teach me how to use the audio board, put a vinyl record on the turntable and not get the, the needle to scratch it very deeply, you know. And all these things receive precise training for how you're supposed to do it. But when it comes to the thing that we do that is worth more than anything else and more important than anything else that will make the biggest impact on this world, it's just sink or swim. Every man for himself. Go figure it out. We go to the hospital, have a baby. The guy pushes you out in a wheelchair, looking at you. He's saying, hope you do well. I hope you don't stink at doing this. So here's the baby. See ya. Few of us ever learn how to parent except in the school of hard knocks. And we make a lot of mistakes, don't we? I mean, there's a lot of times we wish we had known how to do it. But we got this baby who's going to grow into a full-grown person. I mean, Caesar and Jessica are here with sweet little one. And uh, you probably already had some experiences that were unexpected. We do know that they eat, and then they do whatever comes after that. And then they make messes, and then they 
tear up things and they pull stuff off shelves and they just... Our life is just so exhausting sometimes. But parents, I want you to understand that you were given a gift. That's why it's so hurtful to our hearts to realize that millions of babies around the world every year are being destroyed. God loves every one of them. God had potential that He'd placed in every one of them. So how do we muster in our frustration the strength? How do we muster that strength when we're tired, exhausted? I know even though we're faith people, we begin to think, hey, we'll just take a cot to the doctor's office and just sleep there because we, we, we're expecting the next ear infection or, or runny nose or something just to show up in the next few hours. You, you start to lose your sense of what God can do sometimes. Um, I wrote a song years ago. I'm going to read some of the words to you. They've got them for the screen, I think. It says, we teach the children by the way that we live. They watch us take, then we tell them to give. We work for money and what it buys to the kids get things when they need our time. Step on anybody who gets in your way, because cheating isn't bad as long as you win the game. See, they're learning every day, because our actions speak so loudly. What can we say? They're listening to the things we do. They hear the music when we live out of tune. We teach the children loud and clear, because what they see is what they hear. And then we try to change the tune, but we're to blame, because too late we tell them life's not a game. This is no rehearsal. We live on the stage. Only one performance in life is the play. The kids are learning line by line the things we teach them just live in our lives. Uh, it's on CD if you want to hear it. That's a plug. <laughs> We're given our lives to keep them alive. And as hard as that is, it seems to be still easier than to help them learn wisdom. But we're always running behind. Have you noticed? We, we know what we should be doing because Deuteronomy 6.6 6 tells us, you shall teach them diligently to your sons. Talking about the principles of God. Talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. We should never forget that we're teaching them every day by the way we live. That's what that song said. We teach them by the way we react to stress, of which they've caused most of our stress anyway. You know, I mean, we don't, they don't realize that though. They learn from us when, when a friend has mistreated us, and they learn from the reaction and the response we have when we say ugly things about that person they're listening. When our kids were small, we were pastoring. Um, Someone in the church would have done something or there was some problem and, and we'd be in the front seat and the kids were in the back seat and we'd be talking about it and of course their ears would perk up because they knew we were speaking quietly about some situation and they'd go, who are you talking about? And we just had a, I hope he's not here today, we just had a, a phrase that we'd say, Sam Baker and his old lady. <laughs> who are you talking about, Sam Baker? And finally, they, finally they got to where, hey, what, what, would, what did y'all say? Oh, never mind, it's Sam Baker and his old lady, we know, you know. They understood we weren't going to tell them. We were, going to, we were going to show them what the ugliness of life is really about. They learn from us when we, when we act negatively toward our spouse in front of them, when our anger boils over and we get too vocal about it and there's a, an argument and a fight. They learn from that. They learn because that's the way they're being raised. Guess how they're going to treat their spouse or their children, the way you've treated your spouse or them. We teach them by our actions, not only by our words. We teach them when we have time to really look at their report card and help them with their homework. We teach them when we go to their games. We teach them when, that, that they can come home at the end of a day and no matter how vicious school and the world around them has been, they know they can be safe with us in our home. They can be safe with us. It is home in that house. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. They need to know they're respected. They are a human being with, with a conscious way of learning. And they're learning from the earliest stages on. Respect your children. Care about them. Even when they don't respect you. 
Because Jesus said it well. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They're children. They're learning and you're teaching them by your actions as well as your words. But don't be afraid to correct your children. Here, here's something that our world today and our society and our political correctness and all the things we're going through from all the way back to the 60s all the way up to today. Here's what Proverbs 23, 13 says. The Bible's clear about this. Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Now, never do it in anger. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. Here it is in the message. Don't be afraid to correct your young, your young ones. A spanking won't kill them. A good spanking, in fact, might save them from something worse than death. Child might rebel, misunderstand the momentary correction, and the discipline there. But if correction is done in love, I'll never forget, and I'm sure Cheryl won't either, the moments when we would hear our, our dad's belt go, Whoosh. ooh, that was a terrifying sound. But when we'd done something wrong, we knew there was probably a spanking coming. Sometimes with a hand, sometimes with a belt. Now, you can look at us and decide whether that worked or not. I won't try to make any kind of judgment on that. But it didn't ruin us. We're not psychologically defective because of it, I don't think. I think we're better for it. Proverbs 13.1 a wise child, when this correction is done in love, my dad used to ask us, so what was this for? Why did I have to spank you? They were supplementing the correction with the love, and then they put their arms around us and tell us how much they loved us. Our mom and our dad say, we love you, but, but when you're wrong, we're going to check and stop you and correct you. We want you to know what's right. A wise child accepts the parent's discipline. A mocker refuses to listen, listen to correction. So what do you do in that case? In that case, there's much more training that has to happen. Proverbs 15, 5. Only a fool despises a parent's discipline. Whoever learns from correction is wise. So in the correction, in that, in that part of the child's life, that correction needs to be explained. There needs to not ever be anger. It never needs to be hurtful in the sense of damaging a child. Now, I know that we live in a different society today. I know it's a tough thing to even talk about that and, and school teachers and others. And I know there are some children who've sued their parents. And it's a tough situation in our world today. I understand this. But I'm going to stick with the Bible. I'm going to stay with what the Word of God says. Because when you love them correctly, when you teach them correctly, they'll be able to receive because you'll bring wisdom into their life. One of the simple ways Carol and I try to communicate with our kids is the way my grandma used to do it. My grandma, uh, we, we had, she had six grandkids. And it was me and Cheryl and our four cousins from uh, our uncle uh, and aunt. And uh, we were close. And our grandma, when we were alone with her, would tell each one of us that we were their, her favorite. So we all grew up believing it. And so the youngest, who's Michael McCann, who lives over in Oklahoma now, and I'm the first, and he was the last, and I would tease him by saying I was grandma's favorite. Uh-uh, I was. And so she told me I was. No, no, she told me I was. So we, we always tease about that. Chase is our 24-year-old grandson. Now, He's our favorite 24-year-old in the whole world, I can tell you. There are probably hundreds of 24-year-olds in this area right here, and I, I, I don't have anything against any of them. they probably got great attributes and a lot of things that are awesome about their life, but you know what? It doesn't move my heart in one direction to, have, to like them any better than I like Chase. He's the most valuable 24-year-old in our lives, right? I mean, we love him more than any other 24-year-old in the world, and that's the way it should be. No matter who I invest in, no matter who I love, no matter what... What kids are around me, I like them a lot. But I love Chase more than any of those 24-year-olds. And Taylor spent the year in Switzerland studying. She goes to Pepperdine University in the sophomore year. They always travel abroad. And she's been there the whole school year in Switzerland studying. She's our favorite 20-year-old 20, 20 in the whole world. She's our, the only Taylor Reagan McSpadden to us. And she's named after a great president, too, I guess. That's, I'll move on. 
You may be 20 here today, but I don't love you as much as I love her. And then there's 21-year-old Cole, who's another favorite of ours. Special young man. Heart of love. Loves the Lord. And then Brooks and Carly, 17-year-old. Carol and I try to consistently let them know, as grandparents, how special they are, that they're our very favorite one, because they all are our favorites. Because each one of them is different. You see, you, you might say, I get so tired of hearing people talk, brag about their kids and their grandkids. No, no, no. Don't get tired of it. I love hearing grandparents and parents talk about their kids. I love seeing the pictures. I think it's some. Go ahead and brag. Somebody needs to be their cheerleader because they got enough stuff going on around them that's not their cheerleaders. I'll tell you, you need to be that for them. You need to lift them up. You need to encourage them. Somebody needs to be thinking that these kids are the best kids in the world and, and they're on your team and you're going to lift them up. Every kid needs encouragement, no matter how old they are. How many know you were your parents' favorite? Anybody here? Yeah? Yeah? See, Satan doesn't want that to happen. Satan hates covenant children. He hates the covenant blessing of the lives of children. He doesn't want children to come under the covenant blessing of God. So let me move into another area here. And so the Christian church, for the most part, has not been good at developing the covenant blessing in the lives of their children. And Satan is very pleased about that. He wants to interrupt the plan of God. For the life of your child. God has a great plan for your child and your grandchild. A great plan for your life. He wants to distract the parents from those responsibilities. He doesn't want you to hear this sermon today if you've got small children. He wants to keep us ignorant of the power that's in the blessing of confession spoken over our children. Satan's doing everything in his power to cut children off from the blessing of God. He doesn't want them in church. He doesn't want them in children's church. He doesn't want them in youth meeting. He doesn't want them learning the things of God. His efforts are falling short, though, if parents are doing their job. Because these children are realized as gifts from the hand of God. And when we as parents and grandparents are educated in God's plan for imparting blessings over them, we speak over our grandkids every day. We speak over our children every day. Because we expect the favor of God to rest upon them. We need to speak it over and over and over again into our children's lives. Your child has natural abilities and talents that have been invested in him or her by God himself. They're born with abilities. But I would dare say that the, the place with the most talent that's been unrealized in our world is the cemetery. Because there are people who had talent and ability that was never realized. Because parents, grandparents, never invested themselves into the lives of those people. To bring out that talent, that gift, that ability, that thing that supernaturally God had placed inside them. Never reached down deep inside to say, let's find what that is. Let's explore that. This child may not be aware, but as you speak the blessing of God over them, as you continually and consistently speak the blessing of God over them, they will begin to see the significance of their particular and special gifts that God has placed in their lives. I encourage you to search scriptures and, and find scriptures that matches your child's life. Uh, I, I don't know what it might be, but you can speak those scriptures into the life of your child. And there could be no weapon formed against this child shall prosper. I mean, I, I thought of something yesterday. I thought, take your child's name and place it into that scripture. I did that with Sean, our, our son. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. And here's what I wrote. Blessed is Sean who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor walks in the path of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But Sean's delight is in the law of the Lord. I'm confessing over him. He may not be living that today. Your child may not be living that today. But as you confess it over them, as you put their name in the scripture, Sean's delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. I'm by faith speaking this. Sean shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. Sean's leaf shall not wither and whatever Sean does shall prosper. Now that's a confession you can make over your child on a daily basis. You can find scriptures like this in Psalms and in Proverbs and in other places in the Word of, Word of God. 
And, and here's what Numbers 6.27 said. So they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So as you put your child's name in the Scripture, God says he will bless them. He will change them. Blessing children accomplishes a lot more than merely encouraging them in their daily lives. A boy named Stephen, who was not passing in school, I was talking to Carol about this yesterday, failed the seventh grade the previous year. He was in the seventh grade for the second time. Now I brought a report card home, failing grades for the second year straight. Parents had gone to all the PTA meetings and, and they met with the teachers and they couldn't figure it out, but they just knew that what they were doing wasn't working. So they went to the pastor. They asked to pray over him. The pastor said, absolutely, I'll do that. The pastor began to teach them the biblical principles of blessing. And they began to learn it. So they began to speak blessing over the life of Stephen. And they, they saw something change in him. They didn't make him too aware of it. But every day before they sent him to school, they would speak as they read scripture and prayed with him, they would speak and put his name in. And he began to respond to that. He began to see that God loved him. He began to see that he, he did have gifts and abilities and talents. And then he started changing his grades. They came up. He, he didn't fail the seventh grade again, which that was the target line that he was on when they started doing this. But he began to understand. He began moving from F's to D's to, to C's to B's and A's. And he succeeded that year. And he succeeded in high school. He went to college and became a very successful businessman. Because the parents realized that as they spoke the blessing of God over his life, it would change things. Their diligence in imparting the blessing paid off for their son. Children who receive blessings, it changes their lives. You know, the uh, Mark, Mark 10, 16 it says Jesus took the children in his arms. He held them and he blessed them. If Jesus would do that, why shouldn't we? The church has been faithful in laying on hands, but laying on hands for healing or for the ordination of leaders, but we haven't laid our hands on the children enough. We haven't placed our hand on their head and blessed them. Few parents have been taught this. Few parents have, have said, well, I heard that in church. Something I want you to know that beginning today, lay your hands upon your children and bless them. If you've got grown children, take their hands before they leave your house or before you leave their house. When you visit with them and bless them, speak a blessing over them. There are many of them in the Word of God. I believe our children should be taught to kneel and for us to put our hands on their head and to bless them by the Word of God. That's what I believe. Kneel before the Lord. Place your hands on their head. You know, Jewish parents uh, traditionally took a dip of honey for a baby and placed it on the tongue of the smallest child. And they would speak blessing over them, the Word of God. They, they would speak the Torah in, in the Jewish uh, land. But we could do that as, as Christians and speak the Word and tell them how important the Word is in their life. I grew up with a young man named Don. I won't tell you his last name. He He tried. He came to, my, he came to our, our church in, in Lubbock a number of times. But his parents, although they took him to church, it didn't quite stick. They were constantly critical of every mistake he made. He would share that with me at school. It always hurt my heart because my parents were telling me how good God was to me and what gifts he had placed in my life. And they warned him all the time. If you don't change, you're going to be a loser. If you don't change, you're going to, you're going to not be anything. You're, you're not worth anything unless you change. So Don became just about everything that his parents confessed over him. They said if he didn't straight up, straighten up, he, would, he wouldn't amount to anything. Don was a failure in business. Now, I haven't talked to him in many, many years. But... Those years of prison that he spent, I believe were because the parents spoke negatively over him and never gave him hope, never spoke a blessing of confidence. Their attitude toward him was controlled by his action. Don't allow the action of your child, grown or small, to control what you say over them. Our words are extremely important. We must affirm them with the Word of God. We must bless them 
Jesus always related to people on the basis of the potential he saw in their lives. Not about what they were doing then, but about what he saw in them that they could become. This is where we miss it too much of the time. This is where we say to our grown children, well, I wish you would change. I wish you would straighten up. Why not say, I believe in you. I know that the things that are, you're struggling with, that you're going to overcome. Why not say, I'm praying for you. Why not say, I'm believing with you. Why not say, those things have come to pass. They won't always be like this. And then when you walk away, say a blessing over them. Say, speak the word over them. Pray over them. Jesus called the unregenerated, untrained disciples, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Those guys? Really? Those failing, doubting disciples? Yes, he said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He saw what they could become when he spoke to them the word. And the word was powerful and positive. So, in your mind, you see your child as already successful. In your mind, you see your child as obedient. In your mind, you see your child not what they're acting out today, but what you begin to speak over them, and they will become that. And you speak it over them from your heart. To disciple your child, to teach them about God, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. A lot of people are afraid to do that. Just need to let them know that God loves them, and that you love them, and you care for them. You correct them, you discipline them, but you disciple them. Allow your children to see how much you love God and what God means in your life, and it will change them. And before I finish, I want to say a word to parents and grandparents who are not currently living with God at the center of your life. You're here this morning, and your life is all filled up with Jesus. First of all, welcome to the community of struggling people who don't always know how to deal with the children and the grandchildren. I mean, we all run into the wall and go, I don't know what to do now. But I want to remind you that if your child or your grandchild is to value God, they need to see it in you. They need to see you getting on board. Like the song said, they listen to what we do. They know when our lives are out of tune. So if you're saying one thing and you're questioning God, why are they like they are and you're not living right? God's speaking to you today through get your life straightened up. Change what needs to be changed. Commit to what needs to be committed to so that your child will see in you the attributes of Jesus Christ. You can't just tell them you've got to live it just the way it is. Now, I want to encourage you. Keep taking steps that might bring you to a place where your, your heart changes. Make the change in your life, you'll impact a child forever. Your whole family tree might just be permanently changed. I want to pray. Lord, we don't always know how to do this. It's not always something that we're comfortable with when we try to challenge our teenagers or our adult children or even our small ones. God is necessary. Help us to learn to correct them in a proper manner. Help us, Lord, to let them know that they are loved and cared for and cherished. Lord, we don't want to enable them to do wrong things. That's not love. That's abuse. So, Lord, we're not enabling. We're simply saying, help us to know how to love them better. Help us to know how you would do it, Jesus. What would you say to them? you were here in my shoes how would you correct them father i pray that you would give us the wisdom of god and you said we could ask for that and you give it liberally and without hesitation so lord we ask you for that as parents today and grandparents help us lord to know help us to see help us to understand your wisdom and to be able to impart it lord in the name of Jesus. Well, someone go get the kids, bring them in if you will. Uh, how many parents here who have small children here or children in the children's church? Raise your hand. All right, they're going to be coming in here in a minute. And we're going to do something different today. What we want is uh, 
is to bless our children, right? How many of you uh, in your life of raising your kids ever got exasperated and frustrated and exhausted? Anybody? So you know what I was talking about today. I wasn't telling you anything new, was I? I mean, there's Dalene back there with four. Caesar and Jessica with a brand new one. Whitney, one on the way. Two-year-old back there with Tony and Larry. I'm sure there's others I'm missing around here. Elizabeth, how many you got? Five. See, and there's different sets of rules and needs in every group. Every child is individual. How many know that? You don't treat them all the same way, do you? But they're all your favorites in the name of Jesus. Parents, would you stand as your children come in? If, you're, if, if you have a child in this group of children coming in, I want you to stand. I want you to bring them down to the front. Will you do it? And I know Richard's in the back, working in the back on the live stream. By the way, those of you watching, thanks for being here today. Glad you're with us. Appreciate it. Just grab your kids and bring them on down front. Will you do that? And just stand right here. We're going to make some proclamations. You got a few more coming, Darren? <laughs> Come on down, Nancy. This is your grandchild, right? Yeah. What's that? Good to see you, buddy. Glad you're here today. Look at all these kids. Anybody ever thought you had more than you could handle? Where God said he wouldn't give you burden too much to bear? How many thought, well, that one is. <laughs> Thank you, parents. Just, just line up across here for a minute, if you will. Just come on down. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is a nephew. Glad you guys are here today. Look at this. I'm going to put some proclamations, declarations on the screen this morning. You, you parents who are standing here, turn toward me, will you? Kids, kids, we're going to talk. We're going to, we're going to say some things over you today. I want you to receive this in faith. And we speak these things from a heart of faith, okay? On the screen, if you'll put the first one up. And I want you parents to say this with me. My children are filled with the spirit of excellence. Come on, let's speak it out. I, my children are filled with the spirit of excellence. They excel in all they do. They're diligent, motivated, and hardworking. Amen? My children have a vision from heaven for their lives. They will live their days released to follow the plan you have for them, and they will do your perfect will. They have confidence based on their relationship with the Lord. My children hear your voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. My children hunger and thirst after you, Jesus. They're meditators of your word and your will. My children are wise. They bring joy to the hearts of their parents. My children turn away from foolishness and they love to listen to correction and instruction. My children have your favor on them and your wisdom within them. They walk in the Spirit, and they do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. My children have the high calling of God upon their lives, and they do things God's way. They are leaders and examples to many. My children are true worshipers of you, the one and only true God. My children see themselves the way you see them, they are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. My children see themselves the way you see them. We already said that. Let's go to the next one. Everything my children attempt to accomplish will prosper. My children choose wise and godly friendships and associations. My children are patient, loving, and kind. They're courteous and positive. They're filled with truthfulness and gratitude. They see the good in others. They're careful with their words. Hi, buddy. You having a little, little conflict down there with yourself? Glory to God. How old is he, Whitney? He's two. Well, praise God for the, ter for the terrific twos. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have children or grandchildren and they're not here present, or even if they are, 
uh, you can stand and I want to make a proclamation. A few more proclamations. That's a nice high voice. We need you in the choir. That's right. That's a good. That's a very high tenor. Aaron, you better be careful. You'll be taking your place. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is for all of us to say today. And this is a proclamation over all of our children and grandchildren. Maybe over nieces and nephews. But let's say this. I release the protection of the Lord over you. I declare that no evil shall befall you. His angels will guard you and preserve you all the days of your life. Speak that from your heart today. I declare that you will excel in all you do. You will have extraordinary favor and the blessings of the Lord will always be before you. I declare that you will walk in wisdom, courage, and strength. You will speak for the weak and fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. You are just, kind, and honorable. I release the wisdom of the Lord as you select friends and partnerships. I rebuke any plans of the enemy to bring you associations that will cause you harm and despair. I bless your marriage. I bless your future wife or husband. May they know God and serve Him with all their hearts. May your marriage be a testimony unto the Lord and your children a legacy of God on earth. I declare that you will be resilient and that every difficulty you experience will always draw you closer to God. I declare that you will know God always and that you will love Him and serve Him with all your heart. I declare that the hand of God is on your life he is with you when you awake and when you lay down to sleep. <clears throat> you will never be alone because you are planted in Him. I declare that you walk in a sound mind. Your body is healthy. Your spirit is whole. And you will always have everything you need to live a godly life. And finally, I declare that the plan of God for your life that was ordained while you were in your mother's womb will manifest and not be delayed, aborted, or forfeited. I proclaim that you are a child of the living God. Glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we declare this over our children and our grandchildren. We declare this over every child standing here with their parents today. We declare the future bright we declare your word at work in every life. And we thank you for what you're doing in these who stand here and these that we can't see today. We're in faraway places. We claim this over them, Jesus. The hand of God. And Holy Spirit, if they don't know you, I pray now that you would nip at their heels, cause sleepless nights, cause food not to taste good, cause friends to walk away until they find you real to their life. We call them into the kingdom today in the precious name of Jesus. We call every child and every grandchild to serve you, to work in the kingdom work of God. Thank you, Father, for that anointing that I feel in this place, that atmosphere. Now send that same anointing atmosphere into the places where they may be this morning. And in the name of Jesus, we call it done. And we say, praise you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. <laughs> He needs a nap. Go get him one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, kids. Did you know we had this many kids? Look at all these kids. Isn't that great? Glory to God. Glory to God. Jenny, thank you for bringing them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wow.